yeah, diagnosis is, I mean, symptom is leaky gut, diagnosis might be some sort of condition. And then, you know, the underlying factor might be like, you know, the gluten or the dairy or something. And most people tend to focus on those, those sort of, you know, symptoms. Um, underlying. Gluten or dairy intolerant, and really that's not the issue. Yeah. And it's like, then they'll remove the thing and they'll be sweet for three months and then they'll introduce the thing again and they got the problem again. It's like, because we haven't really dealt with those underlying predisposing factors, uh, we've just temporarily, you know, managed the symptoms of temporarily removed the things that hurt it. I, you know, we stopped deadlifting, we got some treatment, yeah. we started deadlifting at sore. It's the same thing with, with, with health, yeah? People do this short-term intervention for, you know, X amount of weeks or months. Yeah. They take all the foods that are, that are bad out, you know, or well, most cases, they start eating real food, they stop eating processed food, they start looking after themselves, they feel better and then all of a sudden they start eating food like products again they start do it, stop doing the you know stress management techniques yep. and the uh, lifestyle management techniques and then the things come back so hey guys welcome to another episode of the interchange podcast and thanks for joining me again now before we go any further i do have a very small favor to ask and that is if you've been enjoying the content even just the slightest bit can you please go and hit the subscribe button on youtube and share this with just one of your friends because the more eyes and ears we can get on the podcast, the bigger and better guests I can bring for you guys. And in turn, the more value I'm going to be able to deliver. And that's what this is all about. But let me introduce my next guest. So his name is Dr. Daniel Kirkbride. And he's a very, very dear friend of mine. Someone that is super close to me. And someone that has actually had a massive impact on my health and on my life. So to give you a rundown on Dan, he's an osteopath. So Dr. Dan, the osteopath. And for anyone that doesn't know what an osteo is, it's similar to a chiro, similar to a physio, but sort of in between the realms. And we'll go a little bit further into exactly what an osteo does. I'm sure if you ask any osteo, they'll tell you they're better than the physio and chiro also. But anyways, all that aside, Dan has a really big passion for holistic health and helping people to overcome things that they've been struggling with for years, which is something that I had. So after a few fights last year, um, a big weight cut and running two marathons with all the stress on my body, I had severe gut health issues and my hormones weren't working right. So for lack of a better way of putting it, the old fellow downstairs didn't want to pop up and say hello. But after Dan's hard work, and trust me, it was hard because working with me, it can be difficult, um, I was able to correct all these issues and we'll go a little bit further into that today and also talk about how stress overall is affecting us as human beings and how we can start to reduce that to live a better life. And it doesn't have to be complicated as you will see. So if that's something you might be struggling with, stick around because this is the episode for you and I know that you're going to get a lot of value out of it, as did I. So I'll see you over on the episode in a second. My man, Daniel, appreciate you coming out. This is the second time we've probably run this up because the first time I feel like I flopped it and there was no structure to it. Yeah. It was a great chat on your behalf, but as a host, I feel like I was letting everyone down. So... We're giving it another crack today. And I mean, I did run a half marathon, so I might be a little bit cooked. And at least I've got an excuse this time if that does happen. But we'll definitely let it happen, are we? Last time you were pushing rope. Best way I could explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Good intentions, but it was like, boop. Yeah, just literally just yeah. getting going, 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 stop, yeah. going. Uh, sorry, this doesn't happen often, I swear. Yeah, I know. I get that yeah. all the time. Yeah. No, nah, but today should be good. I mean, you ran a marathon. I half, took, I took half, not, half a marathon. Definitely not running a full. Sorry. And I... um. I took a, I took the wrong turn on about three occasions to get here. Yeah, so you, you so, drove the equivalent of half a marathon to get back? <laughs> pretty much from one side of Gold Coast to the other. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking good for today. Yeah, we're off to a good start. Elite. My posture is terrible, which is ironic for yeah. someone who talks about it. Do you want to bring go. the chair closer? That might help. You're a good, you know what? You're not just good looks. I know, right? How's that? How's that heart? It looks pretty good to me. Nice. Man, um, really appreciate you coming out for a yarn. I really do, bro. I think you've got a lot of value to share. Uh, so you're, I guess, on paper an osteo, but also yep. someone that's helped me a lot with my hormones and my health. So I think there's a lot of value we can share there today for the people listening about, I guess, other options apart from TRT, really. 100%. Yeah, I guess uh, on paper, yeah, I'm an osteopath, started off as a personal trainer, um, but the last few years been super interested in yeah helping people who are more holistically who haven't been able to find answers because that was sort of what I went through a few years ago you know being quite sick and burnt out and having a few different issues and not really getting many answers from the GPs you know what it's like you go see I a do. GP and I do man yeah, yeah man, you're normal you're sweet your test is fine your test is like three out of four, 30 you're all good bro you've still got yeah, tests man. 
yeah, bro, you're not under 40. You don't need TRT. And yeah. like, man, why do you want tests? Are you, do, are you, are you jabbing? <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> Your cholesterol is so low. That's so amazing. You don't need cholesterol to produce testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> Your cholesterol is too high. Yeah. So, yeah, man, I feel you. So, yeah, it was, it's uh, been a bit of a journey, I guess, from like going from more personal training and fitness to then more strength conditioning and rehabilitation, more like traditional yep. osteo. Ethic. So you started uh, out as a PT, like uh, I guess a lot of people that have actually had on this podcast, yeah? Mm, and yeah. did you have a passion for fitness like from a young age? Were you into sports and that sort of stuff growing up or? Yeah, man, I love sport. I was actually a bit of a fatty initially. So oh, okay. I was the king of Auskick. That's yeah. how I started off. Yeah. And then I went through my like RuneScape stage. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how many times did you piss your pants trying to do a raid? <laughs> oh mate <laughs> I got killed in the wildy that, that many times that, just me? that was just that you. was just me <laughs> but remember going to the wild and getting killed and you lost all your shit yeah oh, bro oh. like what you mean your startup pack that was like yeah. a fucking sword and like a yeah. helmet yeah like that you paid for with fake money online with real yeah. money yeah yeah Yeah. so I went through my my fat stage on RuneScape and um, and then yeah I was in year 8 and I had a, my, my footy coach at the time was like from the army and yeah you he fucked me up real good got me into shape and i kind of fell in love with fitness and training then so it was like 14 yeah i was four. oh uh, actually i was probably younger than that. i reckon i was grade six i was still in primary school and um transitioning into high school so yeah Man, we have very very different timelines i didn't lift a weight or do anything physical until i went to jail yeah right <laughs> <laughs> I was about age 20 on 18 sorry Oh, yeah, that's yeah. I mean, I don't think I lifted weights until 16, 17, but it was more like just fitness. So I like started off, ironically, I tell you, I hate it now. Like, well, I was like, loved running back then, loved cardio, boot camp. I was like, you your typical. Running, bro. Yeah, I love you it love now. Running. You just hadn't I, done it for a while. I just hadn't done it. it was just, yeah. you know, the first few runs, you feel like you're dying. But yeah. Um, so yeah, so I kind of started off in fitness. Uh, you know, got to year 10, discovered weights and resistance training and women. Um, and women? I yeah. like how like so, really quietly yeah, in the background. So, yeah, you know, they, kind of, they kind of go hand in hand. We need biceps to attract the female. Yeah, curls um, get the girls and we're not talking exactly. about the curly hair either. Mm, exactly. Like, yeah. They don't care about personality, emotional intelligence. We got biceps. <laughs> <laughs> they trump all. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, and then I got to, uh, I finished year 12, wanted to be a physio. Uh, knew I wasn't smart enough to be a physio. Where would the physio or wanting to be a physio come from for you? Uh, injuries, as everyone says, not uh, yeah, the yeah. most exciting story. So you're a yeah. broken boy. Yeah, I had a PCL injury. I dislocated this knee eight times. So I spent a lot of time at the physio and yeah. um, bless his cotton socks. He was a very influential person and helped me, uh, I guess, get the first exposure to that world. And I yeah, was like, yeah. right, I love helping people. I love lifting. And this is really interesting in my own journey. Looking back now, I'm like, man, the TENS machine rubbing me with the ultrasound and leaving me in the room for half an hour. I'm like, motherfucker <laughs> he rorted you yeah he I'm robbed like, you but uh yeah he robbed me but he also was a, a good bloke and communicated well and yeah, yeah. that was your first sort of i guess first point exposure. of contact for that yeah yeah so yeah. finished high school was like sweet i want to be a physio i loved i was lifting pretty uh regularly at that stage so i was like i want to do it i want to be a physio and help people with injuries but i also want to like learn like how to train properly and help people through training mm -hmm. so i uh, studied my cert 34 like i enrolled the day after i finished year 12 yep. into pt um much to my mother's dismay because you know there's no jobs there's no money it's not a real job yeah, yeah. second job what are you like what, what are you gonna do for a real job yeah bro i don't <laughs> know how many times i had that conversation with my mom i'm like mom i'm not selling drugs anymore i'm out of jail just be happy yeah <laughs> <laughs> what a contrast. <laughs> yeah. Man, I remember my mom was like, it was like, um, what do they call it? Like government funded as well. It was like $300 for the entire so three, four. And I was like, this, this is just not the best use. How of are you going to get a return of investment? How are you going to afford this? I'm like, yeah. oh, she, she, she could only see her words now. Yeah, right. I feel <laughs> but, um, that, right? Yeah. That lack and scarcity mindset, yeah? Oh, mate. Can, you can take the boy out of Werribee. You can't take the Werribee out of the boy. Yeah, bro. But uh, so yeah, so I started off in fitness. I kind of studied to my Cert 3-4 through like my first year of uni. And then from like second year uni all the way through to fifth year uni, I was working as a PT, doing every single course I could get my hands on. Uh, did some stuff with Woodford, did some stuff with Muscle Nerds, did some stuff with FMA, obviously. Mm, yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess the intention throughout uni was like, I just wanted to be A, the best, best I could be. Um, but B, I wanted to be like specifically the best in like strength and rehabilitation. So yeah, I was learning yeah. off, you know, Andrew Locke, Sebastian Orib, like all these guys who are the goats of the industry yeah, and, yeah, um, sure. just learning as absorbing as much as I could. And then, uh, yeah, one day graduated, opened up my clinic a few months later and started working as a traditional osteopath, doing a bit of PT, a bit of rehab, a bit of training. Just quickly, um, so traditional osteo and physio, what's the difference there for people that might not understand that? I think it's like textbook versus reality so like in reality it's 
who you see is going to be the biggest variable because everyone's yeah. got their own uh, methodology, their own principles of right. what they do. Yeah. I think of it this way. It's like when you're at uni, there's bigger differences and everyone kind of comes out at the same playing field level. And then once we finish uni, everyone then obviously diversifies, yeah, chooses different Yeah, continue to grow and yeah. learn or don't. Yeah, like I've gone down the pathway of like rehab and training and now it's more like the functional medicine nutrition path, but like other you know, classmates of mine have gone deep into pediatrics or pregnancy and it's like, yeah. you know, they practice very differently. And I think if you saw me, it's like I'm not a conventional osteo. I have friends who are physios, friends who are chiros and we all kind of practice the same. Yeah, so it's you, hard to you differentiate. You put a finger in my butt that time and I didn't know if that was like typical osteo physio practice or? Uh, physios use two. Ah, okay, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. use spit usually as well? Uh, uh, lube. <laughs> Spitzer Cairo specifically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there is some differences that we want to be Sorry, aware of. Right, dude. Yeah. <laughs> is it just as bad that I go along with it? Yeah. yeah but uh, no, nah, back, back. We are delinquents. Back to the question. <laughs> uh, so physio, Cairo, osteo. You have his microphones. Oh, mate, honestly. Um, yeah, question I, I get all the time and I feel like if you're a therapist in that category, you're going to get that question 101 times a, a year. Um, traditional Physio tends to be more, you know, they work in hospitals, generally speaking. Mm. These days, you'll find them more obviously in private practice. They tend to be more like musculoskeletal, acute injury. So like easiest way I can explain it would be if you played footy on the weekend, you tore your ACL, the next day you're going to see a physio. Okay. Yeah. You're not you're generally going to go see a car or an osteo. It's usually like that early stage acute musculoskeletal injury where it's pretty obvious how it happens. It's not necessarily a big investigation. It's more like I need you to give me a return to play plan. Shit. Yeah. Like... If you tore your ACL, you tore your ACL. If you got hit by a 110 kilo rugby player and dislocated your AC joint, it's pretty obvious how that happens. It's not necessarily the most uh, difficult process to figure out. It's more so how do we now do that boring first eight to 12 week rehab of yep. getting that shoulder back to the function? Yeah. Versus Cairo and Osteo, I kind of think sit more in that like, like acute on chronic slash chronic kind of condition. So like, hey, I've had this back pain. You know, usually it goes away, but, you know, it's been four weeks now and it's not going away. I'm not sure, you know, what's going on. And then that's usually where, like, we come in and it's more of that detective mode coming in and being like, cool, let's, you know, assess why that's happening and, you know, have a little bit more of a holistic approach of what's going on. Yeah, so, so like, if you had back pain, you saw me for that, it's like, cool, I'm going to go through your full history. Let's look at your training. Let's look at your movement. Let's look at your nutrition, your diet. Um, looking at everything on a whole. Yeah, looking at what I call like the underlying and predisposing factors that have caused the presentation or diagnosis in front of me. So uh, generally speaking, yeah, I would say physios tend to be more, on again, on paper, textbook, more acute. They're generally better at rehabilitation because of the fact they usually deal with more acute stuff. So they're yeah. usually better with their exercise prescription yeah. uh, versus chiros and osteos tend to be more, I guess I would say generally better hands-on and better with their manual therapy skills because we do more of it um, and probably not as well-versed in rehabilitation, generally speaking, and tend to work with people more in that chronic sort of uh, conditions. Chiro and osteo. We both study together for the first three and a half years. We do a lot of the very similar concepts. I think it just comes down to the principles we learn and the style of practice. Like chiros tend to be very focused on the nervous system and the spine is king. So everything we do is affecting the nervous system. You know, when they look at adjusting the body, it's you know if there is a subluxation or a, of a joint or a dislocation of a joint in the spine, it's going to affect neural pathways. And yeah. then affect everything else throughout That's the going to then obviously yeah, affect every other system in our body. Yeah. yeah, so principles make sense. We also believe in that as osteopaths. We're just not, it's not our number one, I guess, principle. Mm. So then from an osteopathic point of view, it's like, well, we also do very similar techniques. We're just not as, em we don't have as much emphasis on one area of the body. It's probably more like, for lack of a better way of explaining it, I feel like Cairo is probably like a 10 out of 10 in the nervous system structural model, but they may not look at some of the other areas as effectively versus a, an osteo is kind of like that jack of all trades, master of none sort of in the middle where it's like, I'm going to look at everything. Yeah. I'm not a specialist in any of these areas, but what I am a specialist in is looking at how these systems communicate and integrate. When we talk about other systems in other mm -hmm. areas of the body, what are you talking about there? So we've got like musculoskeletal systems, obviously the number one that we yeah. think of. Yeah. And, and this uh, is like the realm of the physio and the chiro, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd say physio tends to be Again, like I don't want to upset anyone listening because like everyone, each to their own people. People are going to get upset when we the internet. This is, this is true. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome to the 21st century. Yeah, if I do a podcast and don't offend someone, I'm probably doing it wrong. Yeah. So I mean like traditionally speaking, very superficial answer would be, yeah, physios tend to be very musculoskeletal in nature, you know, mechanical in their approach. Chiros tend to be, I'd say, more of a blend of like musculoskeletal, neurological, nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, and then osteos, you know, traditionally should be, a lot more holistic and look at the other systems. So other systems would be things like, um, you know, your 
uh, your lymphatic system, your immune system, uh, you know, your organs, your your guts, you know, and how these other systems are essentially interrelated and communicate to cause the presentation in front of me. So like, yeah, if you had back pain. You know, I'm not just looking at your joints. I'm not just looking at your muscles. It might be ah, like... That's where the finger in the butt came from. Yeah. Ah, checking the prostate, gotcha. Mm, yeah, it's all connected, man. Um, but like, you know, for example, like obviously we did some stuff on your gut and, you know, hormones and everything. Yes. But it's like the amount of clients I would see that have, you know, chronic lower back pain and they've also got associated, you know, inflammation or associated like gut issues that they've had for right. years. And yeah, it's like, yeah. Yeah. I remember the first time it happens, I was like maybe 12 months out of uni and I was like at a stage where I felt pretty confident. I was getting pretty good results of everyone, but I was like very mechanical. It was like deadlifts and bird dogs fix everything, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which they Do did. Do your dogs, guys. Exactly, which they yeah. did, man. Like I was like, hey, if I just strengthen everyone's back and mobilize their hips, nine out of 10 people get better with their back pain, yep. which is not a bad place to start. But then I started getting a few difficult clients and there was this one guy in particular um, I can picture his face, but I can't remember his name. No, my name's Ben. <laughs> no, no, um, he was such a good dude. And um, yeah, like we did all, I did all the things I normally did. Didn't really work. Got a little bit better, but never really got better yeah. at all. And I was like, oh. And I was that across this time that I came across um, Stop Chasing Pain um, and Dr. Stuart Galepsi. And I went to this functional medicine workshop. And they were talking all about like all this stuff, like connection of systems, inflammation, gut health, the immune system, uh, infections, and how all these systems can influence one another. And they were talking about how the nerves around your you know, lower back, lumbar spine, abdomen area, um, you know, influence essentially you know, the, the same muscles in the area of your lower back. So it's like if you've got uh, inflammation anteriorly in your gut, the nerves that supply anteriorly the viscera are also the same Actually level that's front, yeah right, are the yeah. same level of the spine that affect the you know erector spine and the muscles in the lower back so it's like you could have a gut issue which is causing inflammation around the nerves in that area and now because we've got inflammation in that area the brain can't detect if it's shut one it or the other right is that right it doesn't shut it down so it's like when we look at the level of the spine you're going to have a nerve that comes out ventral which means it comes to the front so okay. it's like imagine your t12 we have the nerve root which is like the trunk the branch yep. and then we're going to have a, a peripheral nerve come out each side, oh, yeah, side yeah. so we'll have one come out each side and wraps around the front yeah and that's visceral so it's like we don't have conscious control over this it's like something that would supply the gut yep. yeah we're also then going to switch on and off sort of thing yeah sort of it's going to have you know certain receptors mechanoreceptors you know uh, visceral receptors things like this okay. um, and then we have another nerve that's going to go dorsal which means at the back and then okay. that's going to supply you know essentially things like the muscles the tissues around the spine so because both of those nerves are kind of entering the same point the brain can't differentiate is that pain signal coming from the front or is it coming from the back? So it just sh shuts the whole thing down. So, you know, your brain is wired to focus on survival and safety. Right. If you were walking home late at night and you heard a ruffling in the bush, you know, your first instinct wouldn't be to go and check who's behind the bush. Like, yeah, it could be Ben. He's a bit fucked up. Let's, you know, but if it's not... Bro, you can't swear on this podcast. <laughs> Haven't I fucking told you that? <sighs> but if it's not and it's some, you know, sort of meth addict in Southport, you're going to get stabbed and you're going to die. So your natural that's response... A given. That's a given. Exactly. Don't go to Southport. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, naturally your first response is going to be safety. Yeah. Uh, it could be fine, but I'm just going to choose safety. And right. that's what your brain does in that situation. It goes, hey, like, I can't I can't determine quite if it's like the problems at the front or the back because like there's, there's two inputs coming in and I can't determine if it's coming from here or there. So the safe thing to do is rather than wait and find out, we're just going to send an output, i.e. pain, as a way to, you know, downregulate or stop what you're doing. So now you can have lower back pain, gotcha. which isn't actually from a muscle or from a tissue. You've yeah. actually got like a, what's called referred pain or uh, viscerosomatic pain. So viscero, yeah, viscero meaning visceral, somatic meaning you know, muscle movement. So, you know, you've got this, these people that come in, they're like, oh, I've got this chronic back pain. You know, we're doing the bird dogs. We're doing the strengthening, the stability, the mobility, but it's never getting better. Yeah. And then, you know, if you're like me back then, it's like, oh, well, you know, either they're not doing their exercises and they're lying to me or, you know. That's the first thought, right? Yeah. It's, you're fucking lying to me, bro. Yeah, like he's not, he's lying to me. Like, you know, he obviously, you know, a bit of ego comes in, I guess. And it's like, must be them. Yeah. But yeah, it wasn't until I went to this course and I was like, oh, fuck. And then next time I went in, I was like, hey, man, out of curiosity, like, do you get any of these symptoms? You know, do you have any allergies? Do you have any uh, acid reflux? Do you have any, um, you know, food sensitivities? Do you have any bloating? Do you have any of this? And it was like, yes, 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 yes. And like, above. when did this start? You know, oh, I've had it for years. Okay. And when did this back pain start? Oh, you know, for years. And I'm like, do you notice it's better, you know, better or worse? Like when you, when you have some of these symptoms, like, oh, when I notice if I eat these foods, like it, it flares it up. I'm like, yep. 
ah, okay, there's the whole problem. Here we go. We've been yeah. treating this musculoskeletally in a box and we've kind of you know, forgotten about all these other systems. So I think the best way I think about osteo, um, or at least for me, how I think about osteopathy or how I think any, every profession should operate in the medical realm and the health realm is we should look at it and go, hey, like we need to understand all the individual systems really well as step one your bread and butter. And then we have to understand how those systems communicate and integrate and like interrelate to one another to have a truly holistic approach of like what is causing pain, dysfunction, disease, inflammation, whatever it is someone's presenting with. And that's sort of like the deep rabbit hole I've gone down the last few years is like, cool, I understand there's all the individual dots. There's the nervous system, the immune system, the lymphatic system, the gut, uh, the circulatory system, system, endocrine system, um, you know, your musculoskeletal system. But uh, how do these things actually work? And there's a diagram that I created on the weekend for the presentation I did where it was like the hierarchy of how these systems work. Can I get a link to that and just put it down below so people can see mm. that? Yeah, sure, 100%. Yeah. Um, and it was, I first saw it from, uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Perry Nicholson from Stop Chasing Pain. My mind was blown. I was like, man, this makes so much sense. And like, why a lot of the people who have these chronic issues don't get better because it's like when we look at the hierarchy of systems, it's like you've got your gut, your immune system, your lymphatic system, you know, sort of at the top. That's the number one priority. And you've got your musculoskeletal system down the bottom. Is this like similar to like the check totem poles type thing? Uh, Potentially. Uh, I'm not too sure. I I can't remember that. It was years ago. I'll show you after. That's a show me after, yeah. Uh, But yeah, similar concepts. Whereas like the, the principle is like, imagine you went to a grocery store and you're at the self-checkout mm. and you have $100 cash in your pocket right? and you scan everything and it's $150. What are you going to do? Steal the groceries. <laughs> this is why you ended up in jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, obviously you get rid of the shit you don't need. Yeah, so you prioritize, yeah? yeah. So, you, you know, you're going to start going, all right, what's the highest priority right now? It's like for you and me, it's probably going to be steak. Yeah, it's probably gonna... <laughs> oh, bro, there's no question <laughs> yeah, about it. There's going to be steak. I'm not yeah? getting that from the grocery store, bro. Yeah, exactly. None of that bottom tier shit. No, nah, uh, well, we're at the mar- we're at the markets. But yeah, okay. you put your steak through, then you put your eggs through, then you put your milk and dairy through, then you put your vegetables through. And then you get to the end, you're like, all right, what is not essential? Do I really need those mm. Oreos and those yeah. cookies? Do I need them? Yeah, do I really need the extra uh, broccolini? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whatever it is for you. So the same thing with the body. It's like imagine we have a certain amount of energy, i.e. ATP, and if we don't have su- sufficient energy to you know, essentially run all our vital functions in the body, what's going to be more important for survival? Is it going to be our immune system functioning, our nervous system functioning, you know, our, our nerves, our blood vessels, our immune system, or is it going to be my bicep and my hormones? Yeah, see a lot of bicep and testosterone. Yeah, exactly. It's like I can live without. You ain't getting big now, bro. Exactly. I can live without a bicep. So you know, the girls can't though. Yeah, exactly. So that's not essential. You know, what's the point of having high testosterone if I can't produce because I don't have enough energy for myself? So why would my body be in a state to the produce? Yeah, more yeah, bro. essentially. So it's like we start looking at this hierarchy of like, ah, oh, well, energy's got to go here, 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 and here before, before, here before we get down there. Mm. So a lot of people come into the clinic or they'll come see me, you know, virtually now. It's like, and they'll have a problem down here in system number eight, which is musculoskeletal, but the real root cause is they've got dysfunction in gut, you know, immune, nervous, or some of these other areas in the body. And now they're presenting with low testosterone. They're presenting with recurrent muscle strains, you know, tendinopathies, joint pain, yeah, inflammation. Yeah. And it's like... Well, this is exactly what I was experiencing when I came to see you, right? Yeah, that's why Literally, I kind of like, kept whacking you across the head because I was case. like... Yeah, like perfect case. It was like, all right, it's called, you know, relative energy deficiency. And it's like, well, if you're if you're someone who's highly stressed or has a high amount of output, like, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> a couple you know, of marathons, six yeah. week bender in Europe. Exactly. Six months flights. bender in Europe, marathons, weight flights, cut. cut weight cut, boxing, you know, runs a business. Like, yeah, there's a lot of people out there too. And I'd say I'm attracting a lot more clients like that now, where it's like people who are high achievers really switched on, you know, business owners, athletes, you know, just yeah. general high level people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, there's so many demands. Like if we go back to basics in terms of nutrition, it's like, you've got your resting metabolic rate, how much energy your body needs in bed if you stayed still all day just to survive. Yep. Then we've got your basal, which is we add on your activity, your breathing, your mm. eye movements, your twitching, you know, not even exercise at this point, just the general shit. if you've shit. got ADHD, that's very high. Yeah, if you're like <laughs> me and we sit there, <laughs> you know, we've gone from 1500 to two and a half. Yeah. Then we add on, on extra activity, you know, weightlifting, you know, which isn't as energetically uh, consuming, uh, what's it, what I was going to say, expensive. Yeah. But then if you've got people like you or people like, you know, 
crossfitters for example or endurance athletes or people like that who are spending well, hybrid athlete. what do you mean like me or crossfitters you're crossfit bro yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah like tack on another you know but in those cases we're going to double your bmr so it's like yeah. if your bmr is you know so your rmi if your rmi is 1500 you're at least at three three and a half now so RMI, it's like so that's it's rmr R- rmr yeah resting metabolic rate right and gotcha. then basal metabolic rate yeah. so yeah if we have if we think of it that way it's like all right well if you have energy deficiency in the body the body's now going to do what we just did at the self-checkout and go, all right, well, what is essential? What's not essential? And bottom of the food chain, like we just said, is going to be the musculoskeletal system. It's going to be your tendons, your uh, connective tissue, your muscles, your joints, you know? So it's like now we start to get, like you did at that stage, it was like, oh man, every second week I've got an injury, you know, I've got a tendonopathy, I've got a muscle strain. Uh, Yeah, that's the next level up. For lack lack of a better way of putting it, like my, Mm. so if anyone that I guess doesn't know me personally, a lot of people that know me personally, like my testosterone was super low. My sex drive was gone and I thought mm. there was something wrong with me. Mm. Um, I was very depressed. I was, um, I had no drive, mm. no drive at all. I was just literally sitting there and moping around. I'd get up and do the shit I had to do, like, you know, for the boxing fight and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. as soon as the fight was over, I had no drive, no purpose. And I, I literally felt like shit. Mm. I felt depressed and this wasn't who I was. Yeah. And that's all due to that lack of testosterone is what I feel. Yeah, it makes a massive difference. And like in terms of those systems, it's like, yeah, system eight is the musculoskeletal. System seven is endocrine in terms of priorities. So that's literally the bottom two priorities. Those yeah. are like the bottom of the food chain. Think of it. It's like females. How many females do you know who compete and they lose their cycle? Oh, yeah. every single one of them almost. It's like high stress, energy deficiency. Yeah. Body prioritizes. Are it you always in a, comes from stress. Yeah. Are you in a state right now to have a child and conceive? No. Do we need that energy? Can I put that energy somewhere else? Let's shut that down. Let's prioritize my immune system. Yeah. yeah or for you, okay, it's like, yeah. let's shut down my dick. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> like, we don't need a fuck that right shit now. It was well yeah. like shut down, bro. Yeah. 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 Like, yes, you so might. It's just a flaccid piece of skin. Yeah. Like push and rope, like we said. Yeah. Um, like, we don't need that right now. As much as we mentally might be like, want to it's like the microphone, bro. Oh, yep sorry as much as we might mentally want to <laughs> get a um, bit close there for me brother but even then like you probably didn't even want to the desire would have gone down the there was as literally well. no want and it was actually like such a thing that impeded on my relationship as well like mm. it, it didn't just affect one area of my life but it was affecting every area business relationships personal me as a father because i was so stressed i was so fucking angry all the time i was taking that out of my son on my partner at the time. And it wasn't fair to my housemates or anyone else around me because I was just this ball of anger. Well, obviously, you know, the high stress, you know, not eating and then having more stress on the body from that. And then obviously the my dick not working. That was even like more so. I was like, what is wrong with me? And that just in turn meant I was taking it out <clears throat> on everyone else around me. Yeah. Which, hebel, you know, <laughs> hebel. Anyways, but yeah, so the... Just one big ball of catabolism. Yeah, for lack of a better way of putting it, and for anyone yeah. that doesn't know what catabolism is, it's just catabolic. So your body is breaking down, right? It literally starts to break itself down. So yeah, I mean, like, and again, if you're going to start to, because think when your body just wants. Just a quick note: my dick works again. Yes, <laughs> not that I would know. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, yeah. but like, if we think, uh, you know, again, if you if we have an energy deficit, the body wants to try and find energy from somewhere. So then we go, cool, we can break down tissue to try and mobilize the energy from that tissue. So like when we look at one of your main fuel sources in the body, we've got fats and we've got um, carbs. Carbohydrates, you know, carbohydrates yeah. we think are stored as glycogen. So yeah. glucose, sugar, carbohydrates. When we store glucose, we store it as glycogen, two main spots in the body. We either store it as muscle glycogen and that's where the majority of our, mus- of our glycogen is, about 80%. Okay. And then the rest of it's in our liver. Now liver is like rainy day think like end of an endurance event like you've got nothing left like we don't really want to be going to our liver glycogen no, we need to, yeah? That, yeah. but if we do go into our liver glycogen it's like liver glycogen and then once that's all gone then we're going into fats and that's usually when you start seeing people in marathons like twitching and you know <laughs> going pretty spaz so if you think about like where is break dancing on the ground and shit. pretty much yeah. where do we have the most readily available amount of sugar in the body that i can break down and convert into energy Muscle. so we don't need to go through boring krebs cycle chemistry today but it's like we know we can convert glucose into ATP through things like the Krebs cycle um, to produce energy. So it's like, all right, I now have, I'm at, I'm at the cash, I'm at the uh, checkout, I've got a hundred bucks, I need 50 more, where can I get it from? Your body's going to go, where's the easiest place I can get it? Oh my God, there's like 80% of this is stored in one spot. That seems like a good spot to go to. Let's go to the muscles and let's go to start to break that down to get that cash essentially to get that ATP mm-hmm. so you start to break down your own body you start to break down you know the muscle tissue you start to break down another big area is the gut lining the gut lining is you know quite high in collagen and cortisol loves 
uh, collagen. Uh, yeah? And this is probably where gut health issues come into mm. play, right? Yeah. So a big thing is when you when you stress, we produce cortisol. Cortisol is catabolic, and your body loves protein. And collagen is a form of protein. The largest amount of collagen in your body is around your intestine. So yep. your small intestine. If we let, breaking that shit down to mm. get the tissue that it needs to. Yeah. Then so it'll break down the body. your small intestine for collagen. It will break yep. down your muscle tissue for glycogen. And it's going to start to break those things down and become very catabolic to try and get the energy that it needs because you're lacking the energy for whatever reason, high stress. Uh, you know, a big thing too is like malnutrition, not just like, and this is where the whole calories versus actually, uh, you know, eating real food makes a difference because yeah, you could be eating enough calories, but if you're eating dead calories or you have an absorption issue, uh, you know, you're not absorbing that energy, uh, you're not consuming, you know, high quality foods. It's like yeah. all these things are going to start to add up. And then you're going to become very catabolic and then it's a cascade. Now we've got leaky gut. Now that leaves us susceptible to infection. Now it leaves us susceptible to a chronic immune response. Now we've got this cycle of like the immune system, the gut, the nervous system all kind of, you know, adding fuel to one another. And then people end up on your doorstep saying, hey, I've got, uh, I've got autoimmune disease or I've got, um, you know, chronic tendinopathy. I've got all these conditions that won't go away. And then... As we know in the medical model, it's very like, oh, you've got tendon. Let's look at the tendon. You've got a thyroid issue. Let's look at the thyroid. But my whole approach and what I've been going deep into the last few years is like, all right, well, we're just looking at the symptom here. We're not going like, why? What's creating? What's creating the inflammatory process that's now causing the body to break itself down, attack itself, to then present this organ or this joint or this muscle with the problems that we're seeing. So really, that's just like the light bulb is when, like when the check engine light goes on. It's like, bing, that's yeah. what's going on there. But it's not actually the, I guess, the, the cause of what the issue is. Mm. 100%, yeah. It's just your red light, you know, on your dashboard flash and saying, pop the hood. But uh, My elbow's sore. That's not actually your elbow, bro. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. it could be if you, you know, dislocated your elbow punching someone, then sure, it's probably your elbow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it um, like there is, you know, it's, it's not the case of, I think sometimes people take it too far and they try and, you know, talk about elbow pain being because of your big toe and it makes it complicated. But I think it's like in, when it's, when it's in acute scenarios, acute scenarios are pretty black and white. Like I was saying, the physio, if you have a 110 kilo bloke in NRL run into your shoulder, direct impact and you burst your AC joint, yeah. we can probably make an assumption it was a trauma and we couldn't do much about it. But yeah. it's like most of the stuff I see in, is I've had this uh, problem you know, I won't say, I can't say certain things, but like I've had this problem for years, you know, I've had this uh, condition for years, I've had this pain for years and I don't know why, you know, I've got it, it's not going away, I've seen other people, yada, yada, yada. You're seeing other people? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're cheating on me. Yeah. Uh, and by that stage, it's like, all right, well, we can assume it's A, it's not acute, it's been around for more than six weeks, anything more than six weeks has now got an inflammatory process to it. Yep. So as soon as it passes six weeks, we're automatically thinking we need to look at other systems because... When we look at inflammation, we've got acute inflammation. And people, people always paint inflammation with a bad brush. Acute inflammation is amazing. It's part of the healing it, process, yeah. right? It's the first stage of healing. Yeah. yeah. If you go to the gym and you train your biceps and you create some damage, you have created inflammation, which is the first step to then you know, healing and then growing that bicep. You mean I don't grow in the gym? No. <laughs> oh, no. Absolutely outrageous. You yeah. create stimulus in the gym, you recover outside the gym. Yeah, I got you. But if like let's say we have an acute injury or we have some sort of acute inflammation in the body, there's two pathways we can have. We can have resolution, mm. which is we the body has sufficient resources, it heals itself. energy to heal and ideally not just heal and repair, but to actually become better and adapt, yeah. which is what we want in the gym. Or we have failure of resolution and we now get stuck in this cycle of chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation is going to mean we have an increase in stress. Increase in stress means increase in cortisol. Increase in cortisol means you know, we're generally going to have blood sugar regulation issues. We're generally going to have, uh, we're going to break down the gut lining, like we said, for the collagen. We're going to start to m mobilize and, and break down our, our muscle tissue for glucose and really available energy. Gotcha. It's going to influence our hormones. Cortisol has an effect on uh, our hormones and our endocrine system. Uh, it's going to have an effect on our nervous system, higher heart rate, lower HIV, more sympathetic. So it's like, how does HIV affect the body? How does HIV affect yeah. the body? It's not necessarily an effect. It's more of a marker that we look at to get right. insights about the nervous system and, the, and our state. So it's like our heart rate variability would be for anyone listening who's not sure. It's like you've got your heart rate, which is pretty simple. So like if yeah. we said- Like your resting heart rate or just heart rate in general? Uh, yeah, I mean, just in general, let's keep it simple. Yeah. Uh, so let's say your resting heart rate when you wake up this morning was 60 beats per minute. If there's 60 beats per minute- That's high, bro. <laughs> I'm saying it for simple maths. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, 60, minute, uh, 60 beats per minute, how many beats per second would you assume? One. 
Yeah, because sixty divided by sixty Quick is one. Math. Quick math. <laughs> cool. So like <laughs> I that, did real good there, right? I think you know, like, I saw seconds. you like your brain was like trick question. <laughs> computer. Is this guy trying to like yeah, stitch yeah. me up on live air? Um, but if we look at heart rate variability, it's looking at the time or the the interval between beats. So if we had a beat, it doesn't. Your heart doesn't necessarily beat perfectly on the second like uh, that. Okay, so you yeah, could have, yeah. you know, we have beep. And then we have 0.8 of a second beep and then we have 1.2 of a second beep and then we have 0.7 of a second. So we have variability in between those beeps. And if you look at a, an ECG, which is like the, the monitor you see in a hospital when someone has, you know, is, is hooked up and they have their uh, electrodes on and obviously they're getting their heart rate taken for whatever purpose, we see those, yep. yeah, the T waves and the P waves. So the distance in between is, the, is measured in milliseconds and then the variability is if we have more variability between beats, we get a higher HRV score and more variability means that our nervous system is more adaptable, i.e. can handle stresses better. A lower variability... So you're going to recover better? Yeah, so a yep. higher variability means you basically got a more, more adapted, more uh, robust nervous system so you can mm-hmm. handle stress better. So if I was to go and smash 10 beers, I'd probably recover faster than someone who had really low variability and they had two beers and they wake up the next morning and they're like, yeah, like a bag of dicks. why do I feel like crap? I only had two drinks. Because like, yep. the state of your nervous system is down the toilet yeah. so hrv is just a good insight that we can use as a metric to understand the overall state of someone's physiology and nervous system particularly their autonomic oh, nervous HRV system better. yeah so we want, we want to see a higher hrv and a lower resting heart rate yep. um and if we couple those markers with things like respiratory rate blood pressure we can get a really good like 3d view of you know what is the state of this person's body because a lot of people won't even know they'll be like oh, i feel fine i don't have an issue and then you get their metrics and you're like you feel fine but what happens with a lot of, and you've probably experienced this, is like you generally have a problem, an acute problem, and it's like, this sucks. I feel like crap. And then you handle the problem for a period of weeks, a period of months, uh, you know, a few months, you a few years. And then eventually right? that shit pain that was a 10 now just feels like your new normal. And then you just keep going on about your life. So your benchmark just yeah. pretty much lowers, right? Yeah. So your hedonic yeah. set point becomes like, significantly lowered and you just think you're fine so if i speak to these people like yeah i feel good there's no issues and then we do these you know sort of metrics or tests and things like that and we're like hey you know you're operating at about 30 percent right now but you know and it's not until we get them back to 100 percent as you would have experienced you're like oh wow well, like bro. i was like you were quite self-aware to be like i know i feel like shit but most yeah, people yeah. would be like no i feel fine and then three months later like oh dude i thought i was fine but like yeah i was you know 30%. Now I feel, now I'm fine. Like now I know what a 10 is and I know what a three is. Um, and having those metrics and having, you know, some, some tests in place and things in place like that is a really, really good way for us to get an insight of where someone's at. But also when it comes to things like training, nutrition, you know, dietary choices, uh, supplementation, all those things, it's like every time we provide an input to the body, we can then see how the body responds to it. And like, does the body like it? Does the body not like it? Um, you know, should we, 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 we yeah. Had a stroke. <laughs> should we? Can we cut? <laughs> no, nah, bro. Don't have a um, with it. We, we with should it. be, you know, doing less of this and more of this. So it's like, cool. If we're doing a training program, like, how much volume intensity can we handle? Do we respond better to, you know, more compound lifting? Do we respond better to more machine based stuff? Do we respond better to more to, to cardio versus weights? Do we respond better to ice bath versus infrared saunas? Like, everyone's nervous system is going to have different responses mm-hmm. to different stimuluses, and that's where like personalization comes in. Like, obviously. There's some things out there that are going to be great for everyone, breath work, meditation, but why is it some people do ice baths and feel trash and other people do ice baths and feel amazing? Why is it some people do sauna and feel amazing and other people feel trash? So I think it's like we have these like general set of principles the same way we'd go squatting and deadlifting is going to be great for 98% of the population to get stronger, but there's always those people where it's not great and we might have to find an alternative. And like we ha- like having a program and an assessment process for programming and, and movement, we want to have some sort of like uh, you know, assessment process that allows us to look at someone's physiology because stress levels, in other words, right? Yeah, because it's easy. Their ability to take on stress. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Like how much stress buffer they have, or what's their stress bucket, their stress capacity. Yeah, I like um, the bucket analogy you use. Obviously, mm-hmm. like you know, you turn a tap on, and if it just keeps overflowing, then your yeah. body's gonna break. Simple as that. Yeah, the bucket overflows. Like, would you turn the tap off, or would you, uh, you know, plug the holes in the bucket first? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think like the big thing as well is like when people think physically, it's like it's so easy to see someone's physical traits. Like you can see body fat, you can see muscle mass, you can see yeah. how someone moves. But see anomalies and shit yeah. like that. Yeah. If I look at you now, it's like I can't see your lymphatic system, your immune system, your gut. Like, I mean, if you, you know, got what, X-ray vision. If you know what you're looking for, you can be like, oh, you know, he's got like yellow jaundice, jaundice in his eyes. eyes. He's yeah. got white coated tongue. Like, you can look yeah. for certain things, obviously, if you know what you're looking for. But it's like. Really Realistically, you can't 
see those systems. So it's like we need to have some sort of uh, insight marker tests. Uh, gadget, you know, aura ring, somewhere like that, where it's like, cool, now I can get a full whoop. insight. Yeah, whoop. Yeah. You know, some of these things are really, really good where we can actually start to get some insights into like your state of physiology and how that's changing over the days and weeks with the protocols we're running. And if those protocols are being effective at optimizing these systems and your overall health or if they're hindering yeah. and when to pull back, when to push, you know, auto regulation. So, Going back to what you're speaking about just there about protocols, let's run through a little bit of what you did with me to help me to bring my natural testosterone back because like I said before, I was feeling like an absolute bag of dicks to now, what, probably about three to six months on I'm feeling like obviously the, the process really started around that six or the three months point where I started to feel better. Yeah. But six months on now, I feel like the best I've ever felt in my life. So Fuck obviously yeah. I presented with, thank you brother, <laughs> I, I presented with low test and a couple mm. of other things. So we went through some bloods and other things like that. Um, yeah. Run through the process that you went through with me because I know there's a lot of men and other women probably that would like to know more about, I guess, how to get their natural hormones back and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, first of all, definitely, uh, I have to say this for opera purposes, unfortunately, <laughs> Not my area of expertise. However, I do know a thing or two about how to help you with it. So I'm just going to run you through what we did and if that yeah. helps someone out there. Yeah, uh, we'll just run you know, through amazing. the process that we, we went through, yeah. Yeah, sucks when you have to be so tightly regulated by an agency. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so essentially, we yeah, when you came to me, I mean, the main problems you were experiencing was low test, low energy, you know, cognitive function wasn't great. You were getting a lot of recurrent injuries, muscle strains, tendinopathies, joint pain. Yeah, the uh, same injuries just kept coming back. Yeah. yeah, and it was always like you messaged me every second week, like, "Hey, man, I need to come see you for a session in the clinic." And I was like, <laughs> yeah. "I'm not gonna." And this is my whole like the whole reason I practice the way I practice because I'm like, man, I'm not seeing you to massage you and cup you and needle you when I know in a week's time you're just gonna have the same problem again. So it's like, so that was yeah, symptoms wise, that was what was presenting. Uh, we did some blood work. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what was going on, but I remember. I think my test was sitting at like 11 or like a nine. It was pretty bad. I think it was like two, to, my... it was between two and 300 free tests, I remember. Yeah, it was like um, 280, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So your test was <laughs> shithouse. Um, there was. <laughs> the level of test that a 70 year old that hasn't had TRT would be. Yeah. Yeah. And the doctors <laughs> were telling me, nah, bro, your test is all good. Yeah. They're still producing. You got a ball sack, haven't you? 100%. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, medical ranges versus optimal ranges, too. So, but they're looking at, like, this is what I feel with GPs, right? You go to a GP, and unless you have cancer, like, yeah, you're all good. Yeah, it's because of the way the, the blood tests works in terms of um, the bell curve. So, like, quickly, uh, I'll quickly explain that one, and then we'll yeah. come back to the thing. So, like, in terms of blood tests for anyone listening and wondering how it works, it's like, number one, uh, if you had a thousand people go and get a blood test at a GP, most of that demographic is obviously generally sick people because they're the ones that usually go get themselves tested. Obviously, there's more people that get tested for proactive reasons, but yeah. generally speaking, if you had a thousand people, majority of the people in hospitals and in medical clinics getting their blood test aren't healthy population. They're people who are sick or have some sort of disease or some sort of metabolic condition. You know, seventy mm. percent of the world's overweight. You know, there's a high amount of obesity, diabetes, seventy percent, something like that. And it's, in America, it's it's pretty That's crazy. Not dude. in the world, not in the world. Sorry, like yeah, America, Australia, America. like yeah. yeah. Um, Australia is not far behind it, but no, not far behind. So it's like I mean, if you if you factor in that like one in two people are obese, one in three people have, you know, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. It's like, you don't really want to compare your bloods to people who are sick. So that's the first problem is like, we're getting a bell curve distribution based off the sick, not the optimal, mm -hmm. which is going to blow out the ranges. And then number two is when we think of a bell curve distribution, you know, a bell curve distribution back in maths is like, cool, we have the standard deviation in the middle, which is like the 68%, which is the average. And then if we go one standard deviation out, it's like 13% on each side. And that's where we have then, you know, uh, I guess like more the, the outside range. And for this, if you were in the outside range of medical ranges, this is usually where like you would be diagnosed with autoimmune disease. You'd be diagnosed with cardiovascular disease. You'd be diagnosed with a problem. Yeah. If you went one more standard deviation out again, you would be dead. You'd severe problem, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, de you're dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or close to dead. So it's like <sighs> when we look at a blood test, it's based off that. And it's like when the doctor looks at it, those optimal ranges are basically you are free of disease. Yeah. If, so if, quite literally, like you haven't got cancer, you haven't got any disease, mm. you're okay. Yeah. It's not looking at saying, it's not saying you're healthy. It's going, cool. I know that, point, you know, let's say testosterone, you know, between 200 to 300 is like, you know, the optimal range. It's like, 
uh, if you're 195, now we'll start saying, oh, maybe you've got a you know a hormone issue. Maybe there's something we need to look at. But it's like, really, we should have looked at it at three to 400 and said, hey, this is going a bit low. Like maybe we should actually do something about it yeah. or, you know, same for any other marker. So that's the problem generally. And that's where people get confused because people go see GPs and it's like, oh, my blood's are normal or they'll come see me and they're like, oh, you know, nah, everything was fine. You know, and they're a bit defensive about it. And then, you know, obviously- I had that experience. Yeah, I've got a- first as well, yeah. And then it's challenging too, because it's like the GPs, obviously the, the hierarchy. So people- like oh you know who are you as an osteo to tell me my gp is wrong which is the challenge because it's like well i'm not saying he's wrong i'm just saying he's comparing it against sick people to say that you don't have disease but the definition of health isn't free of disease the definition of health is you know we want to be optimal in emotional physical yeah uh, you know spiritual every aspect of our life so yeah so yeah, I think if you want to, if you want absence of disease and make sure you're not dying get a blood test see your gp if you want to optimize and see how you can you know, perform at your absolute peak in all areas of life, and that's where hiring you know a functional practitioner who understands how to compare your bloods against functional ranges or optimal ranges would be you know the pathway I would choose. And that's sort of where I've been going the last few years, and have been lucky enough to have good mentors and people I've worked with who have taught me this stuff. Um, but yeah, so back to you in terms of what came up. So yeah, I mean, I remember a few of your bloods. It was I'm glad you remember that because I forgot what it was. Oh, saying. Man, you know what's great? Memory is on point. <laughs> Good sign <laughs> of uh, cognitive function, bro. Yeah, man. Test. Who yeah. would have thought? Um, I'm still salty. I got 984 and not a thousand. You want to crack that thousand? I want to crack that yeah. thousand. Yeah. The natty thousand. Yeah, the natty thousand. Um, yeah. So I mean, there was it was quite high inflammation. There was definitely some leaky gut, permeability issues from memory. Uh, oh, right. Just chronic misses. Mm, chronic <laughs> 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 farting like a machine. Uh, chronic immune activation. Just throw Osh with up in the fucking bed sheets every night. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you're going to hell, brother. I'll see you there, front row tickets. Um, So yeah, it was a cascade of things. It was, you know, we had underlying unresolved, we had unresolved infection. We had unresolved leaky gut and permeability issues, which was leading to a chronic overactivation of your immune system. Mm. And then that cascade of things was creating obviously a lot of stress in the body, a lot of inflammation in the body. Couple that with obviously your hectic schedule, your hectic state of life at that stage just stressed um, on the body in general like yeah. we were saying before a six week bender in Europe two marathons a fight with 11 kilo weight uh, 11 kilo weight cut mm. it was just yeah I was doing a lot yeah I think when people think stress too a lot of people go oh I'm not stressed it's like we have physical stress uh, you know like you train that would be your training your marathons yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got emotional stress you know relationships finances partner, um, you know society stresses you know mm. government stresses whatever stresses you out um, you know mortgage rates those kind of things financial stresses yeah, and then yeah. we also have biochemical stress which is one people don't think about yeah and it's like okay. biochemical stress is like the food you eat this, you know, yeah, the, uh, pesticides the, and that sort of stuff yeah the, the toxins food, yeah. you put into your body yeah. and, the th- and there's a lot of these ones are hidden I just created a PDF on it which I can uh, share with you can we get the link for that one yeah. as well yeah. like think of and this is what I just talked about this in depth on the weekend of the, um, the workshop where it's like think of household products cleaning products skincare products shampoo conditioner spray and wipe disinfectants um, uh, what's, don't clean your house or clean your body guys <laughs> yeah deodorant um Air fresheners, uh, all that dishwashing skin, liquid, right? yeah, like all yeah. these things where it's like I'm not trying, to, yeah, I'm not saying you know be grubs, but it's like if you actually look at what's in these things, I guarantee you don't know what's in half of them. And it's like people think, oh, those things don't matter; it's a one percent. But it's like if you've got one percent from twenty different products that you use on a daily basis, on top of the fact that you eat food-like products versus food, i.e., you eat prepackaged nonsense versus things that walk, actually breathe, grow, grow breathe, swim, yeah. and and fly. Um, you know, you're, you're consuming toxins through what you eat. You're consuming toxins through your skin, your biggest organ of the products you use. You're drinking piss on um, You're drinking, you know, you probably, and again, I'll put my tin foil hat on. You're drinking water, which is full of, you know, nonsense as well if you're not filtering your water. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, yeah, you know, whatever lifestyle activities you're doing, you're you drinking, you, you know, on the bags on the weekends, um, you know, add that to then emotional, physical stress, add that to then training stress, add that to financial stress. It's like you have this massive cascade and people only look at it and go, oh, well, my training is not that hard or, you know, I don't have much stress. But it's like nine times out of 10 people I work with, it's like, it's all the other stuff. You missed nine out of 10 of the actual yeah. issues. And those things don't add, they multiply. Yeah, it's a summation. It's like, it's not, you know, two plus two. It's like, it's two times two times two times two times two. And it's like, right. it's a massive effect. And it's like, a lot of times people want to go into these 
big, dramatic, expensive protocols where it's like you have to do a stool test, a blood test, an organic acids test, a DNA test, and then you got to spend $2,000 on supplements to fix it. And it's like most of the time, you just got to learn how to shop in the supermarket, read some food labels, eat, stress. Yeah, eat real food rather than food-like products, swap out probably half your household of all the products you're using with actually natural products that aren't full of chemicals that you don't need. See, that's where I fuck up because I find that's such a hard thing to do without the knowledge. Yeah. Well, again, I've got another PDF I can share with people. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I'm dyslexic. I can't read. Yeah, Help me. I'll give it straight to you. But I mean, like, it's pretty simple. I've been dabbling in this the last few months and like creating, creating our own air fresheners, our own spray and wipes, our own detergents, our own... Uh, we made toothpaste the other week, <laughs> which is relatively easy. It's like... There's a lot about your teeth, yeah, bro. It's like... Bite, <laughs> Bicarb soda, uh, coconut oil, uh, you know, some essential oils. You can put, you know, you can mix and match a few things, but it's like, it's quite simple. And it's like, you can use natural ingredients, single use ingredients, combine three or four things together, get the exact same effect without all the unnecessary extra shit that they put in mm -hmm. that is just adding extra toxic load to your body that you don't need. Yeah. yeah. And then obviously food, you know, food's probably, probably, it's not probably food is the number one you know cause of pretty much every inflammatory condition out there and is the number one solution like before you go to a supplement yeah. supplements are great especially if you've got an underlying infection or you've got an underlying yeah. issue like you did it's like yeah. you don't kill a parasite by just eating more blueberries <laughs> like you're gonna have to go and, and deal with it but you know the reason you got that in the first place is going to be a combination of the stress <clears throat> and a combination of the shit diet those two things together is what's going to cause the leaky gut the leaky gut then leaves you susceptible to infection which is what happened with you. Mm. We then get an infection like a parasite. parasite yeah. Then the infection creates an immune response. Then the immune system gets stuck in a chronic overactivation. In that loop, right? Yeah. Yep. Now we're stuck in a chronic state of, uh, of the immune system that creates more stress and inflammation. And it's like until you break that cycle, we just keep going in circles. And that's what we did with you. It was like being very specific about when we did things and how we did them. So like step one was we identified what your immune type was. Uh, which yours was, you know, very catabolic, which is one of the pathways. Yep. Uh, we did some specific work there to try and calm down that part of the immune system. We did that for about 14 days. Second part, once we calmed it down, was we then tried to look at reducing the inflammation and going after the infection. So that was more targeted with some antimicrobials. Back that shit. Yeah, went in there with a machine gun. And then once we have, you know, done that, then the third, third, I can't say TH, a third phase was then looking at some repair. And then that's when most people stop. And I think that's the problem is like people go, all right, I want to do the thing and then I'm going to go back to what I was doing. But as with anything, if you hurt your back deadlifting with crap technique and you go see a physio and they do some, the some massage and some bird dogs mm. and then you go back to deadlifting with shit technique. You love bird dogs, don't you? I, don't, I actually hate them. I've never <laughs> prescribed them. <laughs> I don't know why you're talking know. about them so much. I, I, looking, I, I don't think I've ever prescribed a bird dog. They're dog shit, ironically, or bird shit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute trash. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, so like it's the same concept. It's like people go, all right, so my, my crappy diet, my crappy lifestyle, my crappy, uh, you know, stress management, all this stuff has caused me to get to the point where my body's broke itself down long enough. And this doesn't happen overnight. It's like this happens over six, 12 months, you know, three to five years. Yeah, it was like five years of all those things as a cascade has now led you to the point where you need to do a protocol. And then people, obviously, first of all, they want the result in, in three months. <laughs> three minutes, <laughs> Which, bro. To be fair, if you do it pretty well, you can get a result in, you know, a couple of months if you do things effectively. I started to get good results within three months, but obviously yeah. that was the, the very beginning. Yeah, and you were it. slow and you were still running every bloody weekend and not listening to me. <laughs> Guilty. Yeah, put my hand up for that. Yeah, he's yeah. like, oh shit, he caught I me out. I did stop though for a while there. Hid me from his stories, but Amber could still see. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, oh, I lost my train of thought now. So yeah, you do all the stuff for three oh, months. Oh yeah, so you, you do all the stuff, but then the big thing is that like, people then think, oh, okay, cool. And now I can go back to what I'm doing, but it's like, it's not a, it shouldn't be an intervention. It shouldn't be a short term thing. It should be a, a lifestyle change. It's like, if you don't learn how to eat properly, you don't learn how to manage your stress. You don't learn how to auto regulate and do these things. And like, you're always just going to be stuck in this chronic cycle and keep relapsing. And the amount of people, like, I don't know the exact number, but there's a, a super high percentage of people who have, you know, leaky gut infections, parasites, uh, conditions like these where they do the protocol for three months, they spend $1,000 on testing, $2,000 on supplements, they get better. And then as soon as they start reintroducing the gluten, the dairy and the things back into their life, the symptoms come back. Same then, sort of principle with like people that do eight-week challenges at the gym, right? They do really yeah. well for eight weeks, they change everything all at once and then eight weeks later, they're back to square one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's a big thing. It's like same same solution as that. It's like it's the education, the coaching, 
and the awareness, which, you know, you can get a result in eight weeks. You can't get nutritional literacy in eight weeks. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. you know, intervention, but then change <laughs> needs to happen. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Yeah. Change needs to happen. And obviously, I think obviously there's a part of personality profiles too. It's like, you can't expect like having the expectation that someone's going to fix you versus being like, Hey, I'm ready to, I'm ready to learn yep. like, and embody like what it means to be a healthy person. Like as we, you know, we, we talked about this heaps back in the day with FMA and, yeah. and, and, and Mark Buckley, you know, in terms of like the, it be, is do, a the lifestyle choice. Yeah, the be, do, have model. It's like, you can't just focus on the doing and then stop doing because then the problem is just going to come back. It's like, yeah. you have to focus on how do I be someone who's healthy? Like what, what choices do I make? What behaviors do I exhibit? Uh, what routines do I have, et cetera? Mm. It's like, if you can do those things consistently, like even now for me, it was like two years ago when I did my, when I went through my issue, which, you know, I had parasites, candida, leaky gut, chronic immune activation, pretty much the whole thing back in 2020. And, um, you know, it's three years later. That's what sparked your passion for what you do now, right? Yeah, I was proper. You've <laughs> was lived proper, it. You've lived it. You're not just reading from text, but you've actually been through the shit. Yeah, yeah I was right. sort of like around the time that I came across, the, yeah, those mentors I mentioned. So yeah, man. I was fortunate. But, um, yeah, I mean, for me, like three years later, it's like people go, oh, you, you eat that like a weird way and you do things weird. It's like I don't do it as a way of... I don't feel like it's restrictive to me. It's just like, hey, I know that these things are going to make me perform at my best and be optimal. And I know this is what works best for me. Like, I'm not going to say no to a beer and a chocolate every now and then, but it's like, I want to be, my my main goal, my main purpose is to be the best business owner, friend, partner, uh, coach that I can be. And to do that, I need to fuel my body and look after myself. Version of you. Yeah, so yeah. like the sacrifice of, you know, I'd rather sacrifice the food and the alcohol than sacrifice the rest of the things I just said. Yeah. So I think, yeah, understanding that process and being able to you know, take the time to allow it to happen rather than just looking for the quick fix and the solution. That's what probably a lot of people struggle is knowing that they have to make the sacrifices because to get them to where they were, like you said, it hasn't happened overnight. So then to make the change, it doesn't happen overnight once again. Yeah. But a lot of people get stuck in the process of having to make the change. And like you said, they start to see results. And it's like, oh, I'll get back to square one because that old sort of, I guess it's the... Uh, you know, self-destruction, self-sabotage. Like, I, I, I'm doing good. I'm going to re reward myself with the shit that I used to do. Yeah. Well, that's the problem, eh? It's like I always say you've got, um, like from a in the osteo, osteo world, like the way I learned at uni was like, we've got diagnosis. So like, let's use a musculoskeletal example. It's like L4, L5 disc bulge, diagnosis. If I said you got an L4, L5 disc bulge, can you tell me why it happened? Do you know anything about the disc bulge? If you read the MRI scan and you saw an L4, L5 disc bulge, it's like, doesn't tell me anything useful other than like, you have a disc bulge. It's this shit that's yeah. happening. So that's yeah. a diagnosis. That'd be the same as like, you have IBS, you have leaky gut, you have... Uh, so once again, it's like the source, yeah. the symptom, sorry. Mm, insert yeah. condition. Yeah. Which is like important to a degree to understand, obviously, like for a disc, it's like, yeah, what can we do? What can't we do from short term for pain management and for prescription? You know, if someone does have leaky gut, maybe short term, we've got to remove some dairy, some FODMAPs and things. But the main thing that's important is like the underlying predisposing factors and they're the, the causative factors essentially. So the underlying predisposing factors are like predisposing. Do you have any predis predispositions to it? Underlying, what are the things that you're doing that have caused this to happen over time? So for the deadlift, oh, sorry, for the uh, L4, L5 disc bulge, maybe it's poor technique, maybe it's too much volume, not enough recovery. Uh, and those are the factors that have now led to the disc bulge. If we focus on the disc bulge, but we don't deal with the underlying factors, then as soon as we go back to those things, it causes the same thing again. We have again, recurrence. Have a disc bulge. Yeah. yeah. Same as leaky gut and IBS and things like that, uh, or hormonal issues or low test or you know insert condition of choice. It's like uh, the diet, all those things I mentioned before are the underlying factors. We're back. <laughs> Got a bit, of a bit of a hiccup there. Yeah. <laughs> so you were you talking leaky yeah. gut, bro? Sorry, yeah. Um, so diagnosis is leaky gut. Yeah, diagnosis is I mean, symptom is leaky gut, diagnosis might be some sort of condition, and then you know, the underlying factor might be like, you know, the gluten or the dairy or something. And most people tend to focus on those those sort of, you know, symptoms under um, gluten or dairy intolerant and really that's not the issue. Yeah. And it's like then they'll remove the thing. And they'll be sweet for three months and then they'll introduce the thing again and they got the problem again. It's like because we haven't really dealt with those underlying predisposing factors, uh, we've just temporarily, you know, managed the symptoms of temporarily removed the things that hurt it. I, you know, we stopped deadlifting, we got some treatment, yeah. we started deadlifting at sore. It's the same thing with, with, with health. Yeah. People do this short term intervention for, you know, X amount of weeks or months. Yeah. They take all the foods that are, that are bad out, you know, or well, most cases, they start eating real food, they stop eating processed food, they start looking after themselves. 
they feel better and then all of a sudden they start eating food like products again they start do it, stop doing the you know stress management techniques yep. and the uh, lifestyle management techniques and then the things come back so i think it's like my approach is i don't care what i mean i i wouldn't i wouldn't say i don't care but it's like i'm focused less on what the diagnosis is and more on what the underlying process that causes the diagnosis is and if causing you, contributing factors yeah yeah and it's like if you take that approach you can start to work with a, a wide range of people and i think that's why people always say to me like how do you work with people who are very you know you've got people who are bodybuilders people who are powerlifters people who have conditions people who have this like it seems like a really strange uh range of clients you have but for me it's like it's just a problem solving it's like a big jigsaw puzzle but it's like if you understand all the systems in the body how all the systems communicate yeah. and how those systems maybe break down and then contribute to one another and then you understand the causes and the factors that contribute to those systems breaking down i think of it as like I never tell someone I'm fixing your disease or I'm curing your disease or I'm reversing this because number one, I get in a lot of trouble. And number two, uh, it's not what I'm doing, but it's like if we just do you know, some basic logic here and we go, all right, if we have something that's created stress in the body, yeah. emotion, physical, biochemical, which has then caused stress, cortisol, which has then led to breakdown of gut lining, which has then led to leaky gut, which has then led to infection, which has then led to chronic inflammation, which has then led to some sort of area of the body, in, might be an organ, might be a joint, mm. being attacked by the body, you know, starts to attack itself. So we think the definition of autoimmune, the body attacks itself, yeah. you know, and becomes catabolic and starts to eat away at itself, which then creates the symptom, which is you go get a blood test and this has happened over, let's say, a three to five year period and it's not until the fifth year where you see the doctor and they say, hey, you've got X condition. Yeah. Because what I said before about the blood ranges where it's like, well, this person was probably creeping for the last three years, but, but they were still dying yeah, They were still within normal ranges, but it's not until they're outside normal range where the doctor then goes, hey, now you've got the thing. And also, sorry, but there's nothing you can do about it. It can't be reversed. You just got to take this medication the rest of your life. When really it's like, if we, rever if we reverse engineer that process, we go, hey, you've got a problem here. I'm not fixing that problem. I'm not diagnosing that problem. I'm not reversing that problem. I don't even care about that problem. All I care about is what happened down here. Because if I hit that domino, that should then deal with the underlying factor that caused the presenting symptom. Yeah. And that's all I think is like, cool, there's a bunch of different symptoms. There's a bunch of different diagnoses. And every year there's another 10 or 20 diagnoses that the medical world come up with. And it's like, if you focus on being a diagnosis Focus practitioner, you're always going to be confused about how many things are out there. If you focus on core principles of like the gastrointestinal system never changes, the lymphatic system never changes, the nervous system never changes. Obviously, there's always new science, but it's like we understand those systems pretty well. Yeah. So the better you can understand those systems, the better you can then help people with breakdown of those systems. Love it. Wow. It's <laughs> just like... So my brain. Ah. Yeah, so I think... Yes, that's that's uh, that's how I do things, and that's pretty much what we just did with you, man. It was yeah, like right. I didn't focus too much on you know what's is it A or is it B. It was just like cool. We we understand there's some deficits in these systems. If we were to improve the deficits in those systems, i.e., we remove the blockages and we support the process of healing and restoration, and we can get restoration higher than degradation, which is really the the only solution we need. I think of it like a seesaw. It's like on one side of the seesaw, there's degradation. The body's breaking itself down. And on the other side, there's restoration. The body's building itself back up. It's a process that's happening all the time, no matter what. It's always a balance between yep. right now while we're sitting here, something's breaking down yep. and something's, something's building up. Building up yeah. If seesaw goes that way and we're breaking down more than we're building, eventually over a few years, that's going to start to become symptoms and then, you know, diagnosis if we don't fix yeah. it or balance it back yeah. Yeah. so yeah. the whole goal is like all right well what are the things that are disrupting homeostasis what are the things that are adding stress to the bucket what are some things we can remove and then if we need to what are some things things that we can add on top and for most people it's more about what we can take away and remove before it's about what we can add yeah so when you say taking things away so taking things away that are causing stress on the body yeah like you're better off everyone wants the sexy thing which is the supplement which i'm yeah again i like supplements i think they're useful if you know how to use them properly but i think it's like if we use the example before of how I said there's all these 1% factors that we don't consider, mm. would it not make more sense to take out, it'd be cheaper, faster, more easy, easy to be like, yeah. stop doing 10 things that are creating stress rather than let's add 10 things to manage the things that are causing stress. Like to me, it's kind of backwards. It's like, let's remove all the, the interference, remove all the noise. Yep. And then once we do that, let the dust settle. 
not saying you'll be better, but it's like let's see how much, see how much you improved. Yeah. And you know, maybe you improve eighty percent. Happy days. If you've been chronic, maybe it improves fifty percent. But now it's like cool. Now we know what symptoms are actually true and which ones yeah, are smoke screens. Yeah, that's settle, and now we can sort yeah. of attack the actual problem. Yeah, because when yeah. someone comes in and they've got a chronic issue, it's like everything hurts. I've got every symptom, and it's like okay, I can give you a hundred supplements, one for each symptom, or I can just be like, let's just do basics and then let's get those hundred symptoms down to seven and then figure out which of the actual symptoms are actually meaningful and then we can go after those with more targeted protocols. Okay, so one thing I know a lot of blokes probably want to know mm. is how much of a correlation is there between stress and then lack of testosterone or hormone production? Pretty big. So you've got something called your HPA axis, which is your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Big words. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. hypothalamus, yeah. then pituitary glands, and then Yeah, so this adrenals. is like uh, part of your like endocrine system. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got those three there, which is your HPA axis, which is basically like how your body regulates stress. So it's like your hypothalamus will produce a hormone, which then goes down to tell your pituitary gland to produce a hormone, which then tells your adrenal glands to produce cortisol. Cortisol and adrenaline, right? So cortisol is not a bad thing. Again, acute stress in a situation is good. Yeah. It improves performance. So think yeah. cortisol. I, th I think it really gets a bad rap though, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's because it's chronic and people associate it. It's the same as inflammation. It's like chronic inflammation, chronic cortisol, chronic stress leads to you know a state of dis-ease. Yeah. But acute stress and acute cortisol is going to be in, you know, good for performance, you know, adrenaline. You know, if you're in the gym and you're about to do a heavy lead lift, you probably want to be jacked up in a sympathetic state, pumping cortisol, pumping adrenaline. Yeah. You know, if you want yeah. to be, you don't want to be like that all day though, do you? Yeah, no, because not. cortisol is catabolic, breaks down. So it's like if we're in the gym, yeah, sweet, an hour a day, we're catabolic, we're breaking down tissues, and the other 23 hours are repairing, we're building, we're getting stronger. So the problem happens, it's in like- In a perfect world anyway. In a perfect world. So it's like we should have a stressor, a stimulus, and then the, the stimulus should stop. And then we go through a phase of recovery and then we come back to a baseline. That's the stress recovery adaptation cycle. Yeah. yeah, or general adaptation syndrome if people want to look it up. So the problem happens if we have this chronic repetition of stress or stressful stimuluses in our life. Again, the stimuli could be biochemical, the food we eat, could be uh, emotional, financial, physical, whatever. If we keep getting bom bombarded with stresses in our life that keeps stimulating this cortisol pathway, we start to get essentially like a faulty loop with this HPA axis and we start to keep producing more and more and so more cortisol. more and more cortisol, more and more stress in yeah. the body. Yeah. And then that's going to essentially increase something called SHGB, so sex hormone binding globulin, which is on, on your blood, blood test. test. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of guys on their blood tests will have, um, you'll have testosterone, like your total testosterone, which is yeah. the one that's usually like, you know, you're 25, 30. Yeah. And then you've got free testosterone, which would be like a larger number, like, you know, 400 to 600. I'm going to yeah. pause you there. What are the differences between those two? So testosterone is total testosterone. That's like yep. in the body. Think like that's not what's actually available to the body, though, is it? It's the easy way I think about it is like imagine total testosterone is like money in the bank. It's like savings, but you don't have access to it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like and that then, dollar might save a yeah. fund that you started at school. <laughs> yeah, and then free <laughs> testosterone. Wait till you turn eighteen, kids. Or maybe like super, you can't touch it. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that's useless. a lie. I just get COVID. It's true. <laughs> and then free testosterone is like cash, how much you can use. So it's like yeah. if you had a high amount of money in the bank, but it was like a term deposit or it was like a super and you couldn't access it, it's like it's not really the most useful, is it? Yeah. So if you want cash so now. You want free testosterone. Yeah. You want that to be higher. Free testosterone can actually exert an effect. Testosterone. Did I say testosterone? You said testosterone. It's been, been an hour. My brain's going down. <laughs> Bro, um, it's that time of the day. So yeah, free testosterone is able to actually exert an effect. Total testosterone is yeah. more like we've got it there, but it's not able to exert an effect. Okay, so what if you have like a total amount of testosterone that's quite high, but then free testosterone is quite low? Is that something you'd see from time to time? Exactly. That's where we're going. That's where SHBG comes in. Ah, uh, yeah. okay. So then sex hormone binding globulin, sex hormone binding globulin is basically- I said sex. <laughs> oh, sounds hot. Uh, I'm actually a bit aroused. Uh, How so do you make a hormone? <laughs> sex hormone binding globulin is basically, it'll, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, wow, we Globulin means globulin. Blah, 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 blah. is a globular structure that will bind to the testosterone. Yeah. And basically, it's like imagine you've got a testosterone and then you've got a globulin. We need those to break free so the testosterone can then be free and mobilized and into the bloodstream and used. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like if we have a lot of this binding globulin, it binds to the uh, testosterone. The testosterone isn't able to essentially set itself free and go and exert an effect. Yeah. So if you had high free test, Sorry, if you had high total test but low free test and you had high SHBG, then that would usually be a clear indicator of, you know, essentially there's high stress in the body. Sometimes it can mean infection, which is quite common as well. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's good to look at that because it's like, well, if you've just got low free test and low total test, then you've just got low test. If you've got you know super high SHBG, high test, low free test, then it's telling us that there's there's tests there. It's just not able to be uncoupled to actually exert an effect and, and what's causing that. And a big uh, thing we see with an increase in cortisol is it also increases SHBG. Which then fucks your test. Yeah. You also see a decrease in, uh, in luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone. So they're also two hormones that are essentially like precursors to producing testosterone. Okay. So increase in cortisol means lower, uh, lower, um, what did I just say? Lower, um, oh. Wow, it's hormones. been a while. Lu- yeah. Lu- Lu- Luteinizing Lu- hormone, yeah. follicular stimulating hormone. We yeah. also have lower DHEAs and we have higher SHBG. Cool. So in other words, cortisol, which is the stress hormone mm. being higher, will also then push down your availability and use of testosterone. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, on the back end of that, so if someone was struggling with low test and I guess had a lot of stress, what would be your first point of contact or first thing you'd like to get them to do? I think the Apart biggest from reduced stress because that's obviously the yeah. the way we're going with this. But I what think, would be the, the actual things, the, the the modalities, the stuff you get them to do? I would go like so. First thing would be assessment of like what are the biggest stresses in the three categories or three subcategories. So like, is your stress mainly physical? Is it mainly biochemical, or is it mainly sort of emotional, psychological? So like, first of all, would be what's the biggest lever to pull? What's the one that's going to have the most return on investment? Because some people, it's like they're training sweet. You know, life's good. There's no much, not much emotional financial stress and it's like they're poisoning themselves. So biggest lever to pull there would be like, we're going to focus on food. We're going to focus on, um, you know, products, etc. Yeah. Other people might be like, hey man, I, you know, I eat like, you know, my, my body's a temple, but, you know, they're training seven days a week, not eating enough food, uh, all the things, yeah? I know a few of those guys. Yeah, yeah. plenty of those uh, in Gold Coast. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, the hustle lifestyle, right? The hustle lifestyle. The David Goggins crew is what I call them. Like ice bath every day, more is better, train twice a day, marathons every weekend. Like, you know, though, it's, it's, why it, are you looking at me when you say that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the old me, bro. Uh, the old, yeah, I knew a guy. Yeah. Um, or there's obviously then the psychological emotional, which again, uh, you know, not my scope of practice, but even then it's like, cool, if it was emotional and psychological and more uh, that side of things, like you might be looking more at, doing something like meditation, breath work, yeah? yeah? Meditation and breath work, I think, are the two easy low-hanging fruits that are free, easy to implement if it's more like psychological, emotional stress. Yep. Couple that with obviously seeking out some help. Um, if it's more physical stress, uh, again, that's going to be looking at their programming, looking at their periodization, looking at their volume, their intensity, their style of training. Um, you know, Easy things for them to take away would be intensity trumps volume. You don't need as much volume as what you think. So, so no sets of like 150 kilo deadlifts and like no. eight reps. Honestly, the easy ones I could like takeaways for people listening would be sets of less than six reps. So yep. keep your rep range between three to six. So lift heavy, big stimulus. That's also going to help boost testosterone, and be more anabolic when we yeah. lift in heavier weights, the higher yep. intensities. So you need lower rep ranges. You don't need many working sets. One to two working sets. Three. And to then f- like pullbacks. Not even. Like we're talking full minimal effective dose. Like you can go more, but it's like if you're someone who's struggling with stress and, and we're trying to stuff, minimize yeah. stress on the body, it's like every dollar we spend training is one dollar we're not spending on Something repair else. and other areas. Yeah. So if we're trying to be as efficient and as effective as possible, I want to know what is the actual minimal effective dose to maintain muscle tissue and to maintain stimulus. Right. And it's a lot yeah. less than what you think. Like when I was proper cooked, I was doing like eight sets in a workout. Yeah. And I do like four exercises to six exercises. Yeah. Two sets of squats, two sets of RDLs, you know. Two sets of split squats, go home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or so low sets, low rep ranges on those sets, full rest periods, so like a good three minutes rest in between. Giving yourself enough yeah. time to recover. Yeah. yeah, just trying to minimize um, more like that metabolic fatigue mm. as well. So like if you have those higher rep ranges with lower rest periods, you know, we're gonna create a lot more of that metabolic fatigue and a lot more of that inflammation. And we think more inflammation means we need to is created more stress on the body. So we're trying to minimize muscle damage and we're trying to minimize metabolic stress and inflammatory stress. So to do that, it's like we want to get in, we want to lift something heavy, you know, lift it fast, lift it explosive. Uh, and we want to try and stay clear of those other high rep ranges, lower rest periods that are going to create those that damage. So sets of three to six, you know, one to two sets per movement, picks, you know, big bang for buck movements. They're going to recruit a lot of muscles. That's also going to help from a uh, testosterone point of view. You know, yep. choose, choose a squat that requires a lot of intermuscular coordination, a lot of muscles, a lot of joints versus a machine or a, a, a leg extension. Like yeah, compound yeah. movements. Um, low total volume, like I said. And 
if for the nerds listening who understand programming, also biasing movements that have a shorter range of motion and the range of motion is more in a shortened range um, or a concentric contraction. Because as we know, when you're in more of a lengthened range, we use a bicep curl, for example, I'd much rather do a, a really heavy uh, preacher curl or yep. high cable bicep curl because A, it's a shorter range of motion and B, we're working the bicep in a concentric phase which does less damage than when we do heavy like eccentrics. Yeah. So, you know, I would much rather do a heavy hip thrust than do a heavy RDL because yep. an RDL, eccentric load, eccentric damage, more inflammation, more inflammation, more immune response, uh, longer recovery time. So kind of reduce these things. Yeah, so yeah. choose a rack pull over a deadlift, choose a box squat over a full range squat, choose a, uh, a pin press over a bench press or a floor press over a bench press, like things like that where it's like shortened ranges, shorter range of motion, heavy shit, stimulus, get out. Yeah. Um, sprints over cardio. So if you're going to do, you know, it's a short, short, short uh, sprints. Yeah. yeah, like six to ten seconds max effort, two to three rounds rather than. So avoiding high intensity interval sort of stuff. High intensity is good, but again, the same rules that apply. So like one of my guys um, who was similar to you, ultra marathon runner, yep. and he went through this process recently from the Brotherhood, uh, and I got him to do um, five rounds of six second sprints max effort, and that was it for his session. It's like stimulus, you know, stimulate, don't annihilate is my rule. Yeah. Versus he was doing like... Like you said, minimal effective dose yeah. for maximal recoverable. But body. there's heaps of, heaps of research on like sprinting and increasing test levels too. So it's also, it's killing two birds, one stone in terms of it's like, well, we're managing stress by not doing as much, but we're also doing something that's like bang for buck with that yeah. small amount of training that we're doing to increase tests. So This is probably where a lot of people would struggle, especially men, it's like dropping the ego and actually doing mm. the stuff you need to do to recover, which is probably where they're stuck in the process even right now. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Like I said, what can you take away rather than what can you put in? And a lot of people that come see me or you know, don't come see me, like they reach out and then they just disappear because you know, I tell them you're going to have to go through. The fucking shit that you have yeah. to do. But yeah. it's like, it's not a long-term thing. Like I said to you, I'm like, hey, this is going to suck, but it's going to suck for 28 days. It did suck, bro. Yeah. The programming was shit. I hated it yeah. because it was so like minimal. Mm. And I'm like, I want to feel this juicy pump, which I'm getting now again. It's yeah. great. But it was actually something I really struggled with. I wasn't enjoying training, but... Mm. In saying that, I did the process and I got there in the end and it, it's paid off in trumps. Mm -hmm. Paid 100%. off in trumps. So what else could people do to, we've spoken about to reduce stress, but what else could people do to increase testosterone? Yeah. I think just on that too, it's like most people, like we all understand the concept of um, delayed gratification, especially as like business owners, entrepreneurs. It's like, are you willing to spend 28 days, you know, eating shit to then have the next, you know, couple of years feeling good? It seems like a no-brainer, but people struggle so much. Work hard now, 10 yeah. years of reward. Yeah, so it's like you can keep eating shit for the next six months and complain about how shit you feel and how much you're op how you're not operating at full capacity. But it's like, think about you too, like from a cognitive point of view and an efficiency point of view, mm. how would you have rated your cognitive function and your efficiency in business? I had no drive and I had no direction and mm. everything that I set myself out to do, I didn't get done. Like mm. uh, tasks that would now take me like a day to do was taking me a week. Yeah. So you can imagine that if I have five, three, six to six things I want to do in a week, that's taking me five to six weeks. Cool. So let's do and the math. Now, I feel like a lot better. I'm doing a lot more and the, the productivity, number mm. one, but also the quality of yeah. what I'm producing is a lot better. 100%. That's sick. But like, so if we do the math on that, it's like, cool. You spent one month doing less, but now you're operating at six times return on investment. So it's like you've lost a month, but now your next 11 months are kind of worth like 33 months. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, Based yeah. off what you were doing. So it's like, is yeah, it really, sure. like it's a no brainer when you think of it that way. Um, back to your question. Yeah. So like in terms of tests, your water, bro. <laughs> without, um, yeah, without obviously an assessment or a diagnosis, like some general stuff you could do, um, it would be, yeah, number one, see what you can take out that's poisoning you right now, products, food, you know, eat, f eat real food, not food like products. And my rule is if it grows, if it walks, if it breathes, if it swims, if it flies, if you can catch it, eat it. If it's in the shops and it has a shopping list, ingredients list, like the- How often uh, do you eat Ibis? Ibis. I've actually got a few in my backyard. <laughs> Had. <laughs> yeah, they're gone. They're in the um, freezer now. Grass-fed human. Um, so yeah, like that's that's food. Um, in terms of training, like I said, I would go minimal effective dose, you know, sort of three to four sessions a week, even like two sessions for some people, you know, eight to 10 sets per session, yeah. one to two sets per exercise, low rep range, full rest periods, compound movements. Uh, concentric, short and range focused, uh, explosive if, as well, like the intent to move fast as well is, is important. Um, sprint training a couple of times a week with minimal effective dose like we mentioned. Um, 
eat in real food. So like steak, eggs, uh, you know, some of those things which are really high and things like tyrosine uh, and, and choline, which are really good. Uh, depends on where the people are at, but like contrast therapy would be a good spot for most people to start. I think I'm cold. Yeah, it's yeah. like ice baths could be a bit hectic if your nervous system is already a bit cooked. You know, we don't remember that even things like ice baths and saunas, people think they're good for recovery, but you got to remember there's still a stimulus. Mm-hmm. And if your problem is you have too much stimulus and, you're not recovering and then you just keep, place. yeah, that's why yeah. I kind of say Goggin style. It's like, all right, I'm going to recover harder. But it's like, yeah, but you're doing six ice baths a week and your body has no time to recover from the ice baths and you're just making yourself worse. So being aware of that, if you're going to do, you know, contrast starting off with like less intense, maybe a cold of cold bath of eight to 12 degrees at rigs and alternating with that and a steam room or a sauna a few times a week is good. Um, so about building that so you don't start doing like eight minute ice bars in like two degrees no no like obviously yeah build tolerance with where you're starting yeah. um, just and like yeah, anything adaptation, like anything right? yeah like we don't want to go zero times a week to six times a week we don't want to go from zero minutes to five minutes like yeah. I would say start off with going to rigs twice a week and doing two minutes in the hot two minutes in the cold for three rounds and then yeah. gradually you know same as a program we either build frequency or we build volume, or you build intensity. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you can't really change the temperature at rigs, unfortunately. So it's like we will have build Just volume. Piss in the cold pool. That'll be yeah, exactly. <laughs> or we build frequency. Um, and obviously, there is some supplementation we can look into. Uh, but even that, that was my next question. Actually, can I just cut you off there? Mm. So, because there's a lot of, I guess, these testosterone boosting supplements like turkesterone and all that sort of stuff. What are your thoughts on those? And are there any that you're aware of that actually do what they say they do? Yeah, there's a really good one from. Uh, Level Up Health, which is called, I think it's called Botta Anabolic. And it's got a few, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly all the um, ingredients, but it's got like Tonkat Ali um, and a few ingredients in there which have been pretty well researched in uh, increasing testosterone. Mm-hmm. I think it can be good again, but I think it for most people, it's just we're kind of we're reaching for the, the symptom reliever rather than the actual problem yeah. solver. So yeah. I think, yeah, there's definitely... Um, a lot of supplements out there that can be useful in my experience i've not used them too much with myself and my clients because i think it's like you know low-hanging fruits big rocks first and a lot of them can be quite expensive if you source out a good quality one which is the big thing with supplements yeah, quality um, quality right. yeah like if you typed in tonka ali onto amazon iherb google you'd probably get you know 100 different ones and it's like you know one of them is fifty dollars. One of them is two hundred dollars. It's like, you know, you get the fifty dollar one because it's affordable, but it's not very buy available. Yeah, you either have to eat six times as much. Yeah, you either have to yeah. eat six times as much. It's not very buy available, or it's just shit quality. You don't know how it's produced, or you pay two hundred dollars for it. And I'm like, hey, rather than spend two hundred dollars on a supplement every month, why don't we just put that money towards buying better quality food? Because yeah. that's the biggest thing. Most people say, oh, eating healthy is expensive, and like. It is and it isn't, but you know, if you are going to buy grass-fed meat or uh, wild-caught fish or you know, organic vegetables, and people say, "Oh, that's that's a that's a problem," it's like, well, let's not spend three hundred bucks a month on testosterone boosters. Let's mm-hmm. you know, replace the drinking uh, piss on the weekend and snorting a bag. Yeah, or even just like the food. Like rather than spend three hundred dollars on the supplement that you want to buy, that's going to magically fix you. Why don't you put that three hundred dollars towards buying good quality meat, fish, uh, vegetables, fruit? Yeah, things that you technically could fix the problem anyway. Yeah, because yeah. like, oh, you know, hundred fifty dollars a week at the uh, groceries are expensive. Like, you know, I don't want to spend two fifty a week. But it's like, yeah, but if you spend that extra hundred bucks a week, which is five grand a year, it's going to work out cheaper than the blood tests, the um, supplementation protocols, and you know, all the problems you're going to have in ten years' time. So just spend the hundred bucks extra and 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 do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, if you can within reason. Um, Obviously, if you don't have the money, that's all good. But it's like for people who are willing to spend money on the on the supplements, I would to push them focus more towards on yeah, focus first. on the big rocks. Yeah. yeah, man. So covered a lot today. That was a lot, I, eh? That was awesome. But I actually got a lot out of that as well. And I know we've had plenty of conversations about this stuff, but I feel like I definitely get something out of every conversation we have. Mm. So I appreciate that. I know there's a lot of people that will get a lot out of that as well. But for you personally, um, where do you see yourself in the next ten years, like business wise, life wise? What do you see you doing? <laughs> big question eh? um, I think I love asking this but because it just goes deep right yeah honestly like a big shift for me the last six months has been more like events workshops uh, and group stuff which I didn't really think I'd enjoy doing but I think for me like I'm just super passionate about helping people and I want to spread it as much as I can and help as many people as possible which sounds cliche but I think as you know the one on one world you, you're limited in how much you can do so yeah, massively, yeah bro. getting a taste of like some events recently over the last 12 months has made me really envision myself and I think like I think you know I, I have something to give um, you know I definitely know I can it's help not people. an STD 
Yeah, <laughs> I, have, I have a lot to give and I know I can help a lot of people if I put myself out there. So Absolutely I think for me, right. it's like stepping out of my shell, which I guess a lot of people probably don't think is a problem. But yeah, like stepping out of my shell and being a bit more confident and putting myself out there and doing a lot more events. Like I'd say, you know, in the next few years, I'd love to be doing more public speaking, a lot more group events, like, oh, yes. you know, one to many where it's like I can get on a stage and talk to 100 people, 500 people about like all the stuff we're talking about today. Yes, um, you know, more courses, more workshops, more things like this where, you know, it's more accessible too because I think, I you know, obviously I coach people one-on-one, but, you know, it's it's not cheap and, you know, it's not, it's the, not, cheap, not, the, <laughs> not the most... Uh, yeah, you know, like anything, it's like, you know, you get to a certain point where you're busy and it's like your one-on-one gets expensive and it becomes less accessible to the people that need it the most. Yeah, but in saying that, when you say it's not cheap as well for long-term costs versus what you're actually paying yeah. for, it's 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 definitely well worth it. Yeah, like it's definitely worth it. It's like, you know, the the, the alternate of like how much money you're going to spend on disease later on in life, you know, like we can reverse engineer it and it's an easy one, but it's like realistically, you know, in this society, people, you know, with... Uh, inflation and mortgage rates it's like yeah some people just really can't yeah. they can see the value and it's not like they're saying hey man I don't see the value it's like hey I literally just don't have the money I hear that, yeah. and for me it's like kind of breaks my heart a bit because it's like well there's all these people I want to help but I can't help them because you know of a financial reason or because of a, a time reason or because there's only one of me and there's a thousand of them so um, how do I make something that's more scalable that doesn't lose quality doesn't sacrifice my own health in the process because I know from my previous issue a few years ago it was like the issue was trying to overgive and help everyone and um, so yeah I think I vision myself running more events running more workshops like retreats uh, just trying to yeah, share more about health and elevate the state of health in society because I think uh, it's a really prevalent issue that every second person you speak to has some sort of condition or some sort of problem they're experiencing and unfortunately they don't seem to be getting much help from conventional methods brother i love it i love it so big dreams big goals oh and i also do and the education happen. program yeah yeah i forgot helping, about helping other <laughs> practitioners as well yeah so i think that's a big part of it too in terms of like the education program like like i said if there's one of me and there's many people it's like i can, if i can help if i can do one-on-one with someone like you i help you but if i do one-on-one with someone like other ben who's a coach yeah and I now help you and you have 50 clients. It's like now by me helping you, I help 50 other people. That ripple effect, right? Yeah. So it's like if I can help a thousand coaches, that helps 50,000 people versus if I help 50 people, then, you know, I help 50 people. So I think for me, big realization in the last six months and the big reason why I was like the clinic model is not for me. I don't really want to be face to face between four walls in a clinic. Like I see myself having bigger impact and helping more people and, uh, you know, I also do like to travel and explore. So I think uh, why not have the best of both worlds, elevate the level of help, help everyone, and at the same time have some fun, explore, and do some cool shit. Fucking love it, bro. Maybe Absolutely. jump out of a plane with you eventually. One day, bro, one day. I'll push yeah. you out. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, if people want to find you, where can they find you? Uh, Instagram's probably the best spot and only spot website is... Uh, a work in progress for the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro, we've had this conversation a few yeah. times. Oh, uh, yeah. I think the web developer wants to kill me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Instagram, so at dr.daniel.kirkbride and then at... Fake Dr. Dan. Yeah, fake Dr. Dan. <laughs> and then at uh, underscore movement medicine underscore. So I'll shoot them through and you can pop them I'll in the bio. I'll below yeah. as well, I'm in. So yeah, if anyone has any uh, questions or ever you know wants help with anything, my inbox is always open. Um, there's a lot of free resources on my social media. So if you are yep. someone that needs help and... I'll put a link to a lot of those in yeah. here as well, man. Please come and yeah, get some help and hopefully it's of value. 100% bro I couldn't recommend um, anyone that is struggling with that to go see Dan because honestly like from where I was to where I am today leaps and bounds but um, so no uh, practicing as a practitioner anymore face to face no practice, fingers and butts I practice as a practitioner every day brother yeah <laughs> no but I mean like you. Yeah, so if someone wanted to come for a treatment they oh uh, yeah so I'm in there one day a week um so I still see a few people a week. It's mainly just existing clients online. Yeah, I don't right. see like general public yeah, yeah. Uh, as much anymore uh, face-to-face. I do have online services. But um, yeah, I don't know. Like I said to you before, man, I just feel like uh, without going too deep into a rabbit hole before we finish, but like I feel like the allied health model conventionally is very reactive. It's hard to work with people. It doesn't have the accountability. Uh, it doesn't have the continuity. And I just didn't see the best results of us. I feel like when you look at the online coaching model, it's like, you know, people are a lot more, there's a lot more accountability there's a lot more support there's a lot more that you can actually give someone yeah, and it's like we're working towards health versus trying to manage a problem or trying to manage pain yeah. and to me I just didn't align man I could be in the clinic and you just all day every day is just trying to you know put fires out it's like I don't want to put fires out that's 10% of my brain capacity and like if I put a fire out and someone comes back and then the fire's there again it's like uh, you know it's it's fine it's like there's no nothing against it people 
obviously love that model and if it works for them each to their own but just for me it was like my own values my own skills my own uh goals and passions i'm like it's not for me i'd rather work with less people more intimately one-on-one have full autonomy over me i help them and like be able to see them throughout their whole journey go from you know like you did like that fills me up that lasts me i'm like fuck yeah you were like i you were you know where you were and now you're here yeah Yeah? versus like that's that makes me happy versus like, cool, you have back pain, I cracked your back and you walk out, you feel good and then two, week, week, yeah. Yeah, two weeks later you have back pain again because you didn't fix any of the underlying causes. So um, obviously, you know, we can, I always try and give my clients programs and give them advice outside of those sessions but what the biggest thing we both know when it comes to creating change is accountability and support. And it's like, if I don't see you or speak to you for two weeks versus if you're a client and I'm, we're chatting every day and you know, hey, how do I do this? You know, can I have this or that? And it's like, I've got a whole, re- whole resource library, a whole education library, videos and everything, exercises. Like, you know, you talk to me every day. It's like the chances of you getting better are significantly higher than if you were to see me once every, whenever you need me. Yeah. So to me, it just makes sense and the model aligns with my values and my morals. For sure, brother. Well, man, thank you very much for coming on. I think that uh, definitely covered it a lot better than the last time. Yeah. Oh, you got the fist bump. Thank you, my man. Thanks, bro. Appreciate you having me. And um, yeah, that was, that was good fun. My pleasure, brother. Sweet, man.